this is uh, Mina Shamali from Film and Game Composers. I'm here interviewing Mr. James Levine. James, lovely to meet you and lovely to speak to you. And uh, let's get into it. So, you work on, you seem to work on a lot of like, you know, uh, crimes and uh, dramas and thrillers mm -hmm. and, and sure. well, horror with American Horror Story and everything. Uh, do you tend to gravitate to certain types of projects? And you feel like, you know, that's the kind of thing you like to do? Or is it more assessing each project you find based by, you know, case by case? Well, I mean, um, I sort of, I'm always happy to be working. Uh, so I start from that place. And then I think that the projects that ha I've gravitated to or projects that have gravitated toward me are, are really like character driven, regardless of whether it's crime or horror or comedy or you know, whatever else, um, typically, um, I feel like I do best with, um, when there's strong characters and strong character development that I can really, you know, uh, hone in on as it pertains to the score and the music. Yeah. So, so, so you get the project and you kind of, you connect with it and see where exactly. you go from there. Yeah. Lovely. It's like, you feel, I feel like I have to connect with the characters and the story and, uh -oh. as well as the subject matter, but you know, if they're strong characters, then I feel like it's much easier to come up with ideas and, and points of view. I love it. Yeah. And so one of your latest works is The Last Ship. Mm -hmm. uh, and how has that played? In, how has this process played into, you know, well, getting into the project to begin with and then writing for it? Uh, well, I, um, I uh, have a relationship with uh, a couple of the producers on the show. And so that's sort of how the project came about. And then beyond that, um, my friends are the sort of the executive producers and the writers. And um, so we had a lot of conversations, you know, as they were sort of developing the show about characters. And then once they got into making the show, um, you know, it really, even though it's sort of like this global pandemic and very broad and sort of uh, this muscular sort of action, you know, military show, uh, one of the things that we really try to focus on and highlight is, you know, the, the, the different characters' sort of personal journeys through what they're experiencing uh, in, in trying to find the cure and, and deliver a cure to, uh, to the world. And has, uh, because if this is actually based on a novel uh, mm -hmm. from 1988, was, does that kind of play into your process at all? Or is it like what the showrunners give you and that's what you kind of work with? Yeah, I mean, I sort of focused on the show because yeah. sometimes, you know, the novel, you know, can also, you know, take twists and turns and, and stuff like that. But so I really focused on the characters that we were dealing with, you know, on screen and, and you know, sort of some of the um, the broader, you know, uh, themes and thematics of the show, I'm sure are relevant to the novel. But specifically, I'm really focused on the picture that's in front of me. <laughs> Great. Uh, and, well, I suppose it like, just just staying with the last ship for uh, for a couple of more minutes uh, is maybe so, what can you tell us more about the I don't know something specific musically that you've had to kind of kind of do or or just work on um, or focus on and coming come out with it like is there anything particular well, yeah sorry in the first season um, we really focused a, l a lot of uh, the work uh, was focused on people's relationships uh, with their families and losing their families or l yearning for their families and 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 losing communication and contact with families so there's a lot of work on you know family themes and personal themes and how characters were you know dealing with that you know individually as well as collectively and i think in the second season um i don't want to spoil it because i think yeah. that the episodes haven't been out but we deal with that and then we deal with other characters um, who come into play that um, that are sort of trying to take advantage of the situation in the world and and uh, create their own power systems, and so those characters uh, present uh, interesting and exciting musical opportunities that we've worked on pretty hard. Now, this is the great thing that I'm realizing about the way you're talking. 
Hans Zimmer usually speaks about how he talks to directors and, and uh, about working, and he, he, how he says he never talks about music, and you're not actually talking, like, you're, he focuses on the story, focuses on the thing. And is that something kind of you, you've learned from working at Remote Control, or? Oh yeah, most definitely. <laughs> uh, I mean, without a doubt. You know, it's been a long time since I've done a, a project with Hans, but as you probably know from doing research to get, you know, to for us sitting down, you know, I started out, apprenticing with Hans and really learning with him and having the wonderful opportunity of sitting in the room and and you know just getting my mind blown and, and distorted and crushed in the way that I thought my job was going to be and, and sort of he opened it up and made it really uh, it's it's really um, the process is is so much more personal this way if that makes any sense you know oh. we, we sort of, we all you know Hans and, and myself and other other great composers you know here and, and outside of here I think we all like uniformly try to find our own place inside of a story, no matter what it is, no matter how outlandish or, or kooky or crazy or real or not, or, or you know, scientific, whatever it is, we, you have to uh, place yourself as a character inside of that story in order to, you know, completely, you know, immersively, you know, write some music that somehow connects and, and, and touches people. You know? mm. Now, that's that's absolutely great, and you're actually your studio is in remote control productions. It so. is, yeah. So yeah, you're all... I've been, I've been, uh, you know, I I uh, came to Los Angeles in 1997 and worked, uh, you know, started out at what was then Media Ventures as an intern, and then worked with Hans and and assisted another great composer, Jeff Rona, who was here for a while, and then just you know was able to sit and and join Hans and work on some of his projects and really just absorb and learn and and. Um, and uh, you know, get a lot of great experience that way. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Well, there's a question I wanted to ask about you know, being at remote control. It's uh, this is slightly, you know, left to field, mm -hmm. uh, but something I've heard recently is like, when you know some producers or like video game uh, creators or or directors that kind of thing, they looked for the remote control sound, <laughs> you know, and that oh. like so they. Uh, and I think that's that's evident specifically with Lorne Balfe. Uh, uh -huh. When, for example, when they hired him for Assassin's Creed Three, and mm -hmm. did it, no, it was like for Revelation of Three, and some people were like, oh, you know, that's what what these uh, they're looking for is the the remote control sound. Is that really a thing, or is that just people's assumptions? Do you think? It's just like, do people actually go like after the rem the remote control sound when they're they're looking for Zimmer and Co. I mean, I think that that's definitely. If someone's saying that, then it's probably true. Um, uh, that's I, that's just speculation from from. Yeah, Pete. I mean, yeah. I, think, I think you know, there's a sound that a lot of people here, you know, can do because, um, you know, we've come up learning a certain way to write, a certain way to program, a certain way to use the technology. Uh, so there's like a level of uh, experience, and like we all know how to make things sound a certain way. And then, you know, compositionally, I think we're all kind of different individuals. So I think it's sort of, you know, you know, it, it's sort of like a safe, it's sort of a safe thing, I think, where people feel safe because they know that they're going to get a certain level of quality and maybe a certain style of writing. But typically, I don't think it always ends up being exactly what someone thinks it's going to be. But maybe we can give them a level of comfort because of the experience and you know the perceived sound or, or whatever yeah. um, you know we all bring to the table by having sort of gone through this system of you know composition production um, you know interpersonal skills what have you you know all these mm. things that sort of go into making uh, the the musical portion of a project enjoyable and exciting and fun you know? mm, that's yeah that's pretty cool that cool. that makes sense makes a lot of sense uh, and obviously from from these days you, you're you're not a stranger to working with like a lot of lighthearted material from when you started with like you know working on Madagascar, and even these days you're working on uh, the last season of Glee. Yeah, well we finished. Oh, uh, we finished it. I'm sorry. It, well, just finished it. Yeah, we just finished the last season, and um, and also you know Royal Pains I do, which is on TV right now, and it's a summer show, and that's a bit lighter as well. Yeah. Nice, and and also the New Normal, which is like another uh, another type yeah. of sitcom. So, uh, how different does your role end up being? Uh, from like you know all the other really heavy dark stuff that you do. Well, I mean my role is the same, um, but the approach is, uh, you know, the approach is slightly 
it's slightly trickier, you know, because with comedy or some of these lighter shows, it's, you always you ride this delicate, you know, line of um, not playing things too comedic, so it becomes sort of, you know, cartoony, and and maintaining a lightness and a and a and a level of fun, but at the same time, you can easily veer off the path, and then. There, there's no um, you lose the stakes of the story you lose depth of character um, you know you lose the import of these people actually even though it's fictional and it's light there still needs to be some real you know genuine um, you know character that's here that's in the story otherwise it just becomes foolish you know? <laughs> and, and it becomes kind of like why would anybody spend their time watching something if they don't see some piece of themselves in the story, no matter how crazy it is? I mean, like, think about Seinfeld. It's like, Seinfeld just kind of like, he jokes about, what is it? He, says, he like jokes about the obvious. You know, everything's a joke about the obvious. So it's obviously yeah. things that we're all thinking, even though it's kind of kooky and crazy in this world that they create. But yeah. there's something very real in that story, you know? Mm. That's, a, that's, a, that's a very good point. And I suppose it's a, a bit more real than it would be in... Uh, a thriller dry and crime kind of thing sorry thriller crime drama because a lot of those things are like very specific uh he you know heavy things that maybe not everyone will experience in their life sure yeah uh yeah, maybe, maybe yeah well potentially could, does that help you kind of craft a different kind of uh different kind of score different kind of soundtrack approach to, to those things because they're so like you know if it's if it's like NCIS uh, LA or like you know detectives or that kind of thing they have a very specific uh, th as characters they, they face a very specific set of circumstances and challenges that yeah. not everyone will actually identify with as firsthand mm -hmm. uh, so how does that yeah. affect how you work with them well it's like super, it's a little superhuman maybe some of the like Glee for instance it's like even though it kind of gets funny and a little you know silly at times it's you know you're these kids are real and the characters are real so we never try to make them seem dumb and foolish even though some of the situations they're in might seem dumb and foolish you know <laughs> even though it's like completely you know you know unbelievable on some level it's like we never want our characters or, or to, to to seem unbelievable you know or to seem like they're not really committed to the life that they're leading in that story if that makes sense it's oh, a little absolutely you know, you know what I mean? Like we have to be, they're committed to their role and they're committed to their life and this, whatever they're saying, no matter how crazy it might be to us on the outside, to them on the inside as actors, that's, or as characters, as people, uh, that that's, that's who they are. They're legitimately going through this, this experience. So we have to honor that. Mm, absolutely. And not make fun of, it. like my job is not to make fun of what's happening on screen. It's to, you know, to sort of make it make it seem light or make it seem dark or make it seem serious or make it be uncomfortable you know all those those things that might happen in comedy you know? and and that is i think golden advice for any composer uh, yeah. if it's comedy and i suppose even even with with the flip side or if it's if it's completely serious uh, -huh. uh do, does that kind of similarly apply in like not because obviously in comedy you're not making fun of the characters but how do you honor how do you then honor your characters in in these dark much darker situations um, well, you know, you, you decide, um, I think that in, in, in every show, uh, something I try to do is, is find the point of view of the scene as it relates to the music. So like some of the conversations I may have with a produ producer or a director, uh, would start with, okay, you know, if there's a challenging scene, I might say, okay, now who's, who's point of, whose perspective am I going to play? in this scene because if it's all dark and I just play dark then it's like I might set a tone mm -hmm. but you're not gonna viscerally connect yeah with the story you might be like this is really fucked up this is really dark this is really <laughs> creepy but if I can find one more level of being personal in the music then I'm going to um, maybe take you someplace you didn't expect to go mm. and i'm also going to add depth to the story if that makes sense absolutely and that's another golden piece of advice for any composers mm. uh, uh well uh speaking of directors and showrunners um mm. in these relationships the the you know if you're in relationship with the showrunner or director uh, does it what resonates more with your work ethic is it more 
uh, if someone who gives you a lot of freedom and kind of you know trusts what you can bring to the table, or is it more the guy, the person that has a very specific vision of what they want? Like, is there one that kind of works for you more than the other? You know, I think each relationship is really uh, different, and some uh, producers and directors have very, very specific ideas. But at the same time, those producers and directors are looking for me to surprise them a little bit mm. and to maybe, you know, have a dialogue and have a, you know, a, a conversation about, well, what if we did it this way? Or, or maybe I'll see a scene differently and then we can have those conversations. And then that then it becomes sort of both things that you're talking about. And ultimately, that's kind of what you want. You want mm. someone who's going to be, you know, really appreciate you know what you do and and let you kind of run with it but at the same time it's like i need a little i need a little direction i need a little focus i need a little you know in some and so in the best cases and in fortunately uh you know i've been able to work with some great people it's, it's just we we have we're able to sort of do both of those things we're able to sort of take a broad you know look at the broad strokes and then i can do some stuff and then it's like ooh, i like that and then I'll take that and hone it and then sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And then, you know, it's like sometimes knowing what somebody doesn't like is more important than knowing what they do like. Gotcha. So it's yeah. you know, so it's not so sometimes, you know, you get free reign, you do a lot of shit that people don't like, but at least <laughs> it's probably gonna get you closer to what they do like. So that's just part of the process. So. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, so and I suppose the way you've been uh, you know, you've learned to interact over the years, uh, with with directors and showrunners means that the way you have that dialogue is is again never focused on like oh you should you should you should do a synth there and a, and a strings line there that kind of thing it is really more focused on the story and the characters in in a, in yeah, a positive way yeah i mean sometimes people you know want or suggest specific things and that's cool uh but yeah i mean ultimately it's 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 sort of my job to decide that and then hopefully uh it sort of like aligns with what you know what someone else is thinking cool all right well what's the most kind of unexpected thing that's happened so far to you in your career or, or maybe the most unexpected thing you came up with something that's just really surprising like this is you know it's made you kind of stop and look at it kind of thing, you know um Hmm. As it with with respect to like a specific piece of music or or whatever, Any, anything that you you will classify in your life as unexpected. <laughs> I think one of the more you know unexpected things is that you know I don't know I'm not a very like forward looking person as it comes when it comes to the way I think about you know music and and what I do every day. I really try to focus on the here and now and be very present. But I think looking back at the last like 10 years, which is about, you know, I've had a pretty nice run the last 10 years. I think looking back is just, you know, I was actually just thinking about this the other day. It's like I still love to, um, you know, to come up with new ideas. I love to push myself. I love to keep listening to new music and, and experimenting and trying to make my music better and stronger and just more interesting. And, and sort of that it really is like, uh, you know, I feel very grateful and very fortunate that, uh, you know, I'm not, I haven't run out of notes yet. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> we, we have so many infinite possibilities. It's a really exciting, it's a really exciting thing to be able to do every day. You know, it's pretty awesome. Cool. Now that's, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, now we at Film and Game Composers, we like to review, you know, we review a lot of gear and we look at a lot of stuff. Uh, and a lot of tools, and obviously the tools mean nothing without the talent and the vision. But sure. you know, what are your favorite toys? Oh my gosh! <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Did, did I open up a half-hour uh, conversation there? I know, right? Well, <laughs> my favorite toys. Well, my favorite toys are you know I have a really nice piano at home that is still like therapy for me, which is also another surprising thing that I still love to just sit and play. Um, you know, I use. Uh, Logic, um, and I think some of the best toys are just like all these great new plugins that everybody, you know, that keep coming out and keep, you know, getting <laughs> exciting. And one of the cool things about being here is, you know, you sit at lunch and someone's there and you're like, oh, have you heard about this thing? Oh, have you heard about this thing? Or you should check out this thing. And it's like some of these, like, um, I'm using like all these sound toys plugins now and like yeah, the FabQ, yeah. all the FabQ, like all these great 
really nice EQs and compressors. I think changing that up has been pretty exciting and and just never, you know, sort of, you know, getting complacent with the technology and with sort of some of the new fun stuff that's coming out, you know. And you guys, just and you guys to... sorry, and you guys at Remote Control actually get some in-house stuff developed as well, don't you? Yeah, you know, Hans does his own samples. I don't, I'm not really involved in that. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, he does a lot of, I mean, we definitely, there's definitely like an inside track to some stuff because you're here uh, and certainly the techniques of using them, people, you know, we all push the stuff really, really hard, you know, like I got a new, I have these new trash, these new Macs that I bought like a year ago or something yeah. and it's like, literally, I mean, I was like, I'll never, you, you know, now I'm like, oh wow, I'm really pushing this thing pretty, it's like, just like that. <laughs> You push it. Oh, uh, Lord. You are. You want to do more and more and more and more. So, um, so yeah, I mean, there's some in-house stuff. And, you know, I think Hans was involved with some synths that we're using now uh, that I think are commercially available. So that's cool. That's pretty um, cool. But, yeah, it's a fun place in terms of that. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I'm because I'm looking at you right now through the video, and uh, it it looks very cozy. It looks very comfy. So it's like, but this is actually your studio and remote control. It's not your home, right? Right. <laughs> uh, yes. So, you know. See, as, as you kind of treat it like a second home, how do you keep your life balanced? Um. <laughs> <laughs> oh Lord. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a that's that's a tough one. I think. Um, how do I keep my life balanced? I like to ski, so I've committed to that in the last five years, to trying to carve out time to to do that. And I have uh, a great family, so I try to you know, spend as much time with my kids as I can. And, you know, sometimes the job is tough and sometimes the hours are tough, but I try to uh, carve out, you know, time for myself and, and make that a priority and time for my family and make that a priority too. But it's hard, it's hard. I mean, if left to my own device, if I didn't, if I wasn't conscious of that, I'd probably just be in the studio like 20 hours a day, every day. You know? And isn't that the case with all of us? Exactly, right? <laughs> exactly. Well, James, thank you so much. Uh, the Emmys are just around the corner, so uh, your music speaks for itself. Thank you uh, very much. So, and hopefully there will be a little award that speaks for itself at some okay. point. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you so much. For, All right. <laughs> thank you so much for your time. Thank you and, very much. Uh, hope you've enjoyed this. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks so much. Well,